right, so good morning. Tough crowd. It's like a cricket match last night I heard. Good guys won, India. <laughs> this is good, okay. So let's get started. So we're gonna talk about measuring the impact of stories. I think it works from three o'clock in the morning. And maybe if this works. Uh-oh, technical difficulties. Okay. Oh, there we go. That's me. You guys already met me, though, so perfect. We're good. And if you want to find me, here's my contact info and stuff that I do. That's fun. But time is short. So I guess I start with people don't read ads. People read what interests them. And Stories tend to interest people. They've interested us for a long time. We've had paintings in caves to Harry Potter, all stories. And it turns out we're not very original as a species because all of the stories we tell follow the same arcs and they all do the same thing. And as marketers, that's really awfully convenient because they connect us with one another they engage us, and we all know that attention is kind of a finite resource. It's a little hard to get. They inform and they educate people, which is also kind of useful if you're trying to sell them something. They inspire you to do things, and most importantly, they make you feel an emotional connection. They make you loyal. They make you more apt to do something. Which is just a whole nice way of saying that stories help us get attention. They help people believe you. They create that emotional connection, and they make your brand or your company more memorable. So these things are objectively good, right? So why do we need to measure them? So why am I even here? Stories are good. We've proven it over a couple millennia. What's the point? The point is it doesn't matter what you know. It matters what you can prove. So let's talk about the problem. And this is a fun problem that I started thinking about because my background is in finance. Before I did this, I worked for real estate developers. And then I somehow got myself into marketing and here I am. Oops. So every story that I have kind of starts like this. Every client engagement kind of starts like this. We all, there's some conference just like this one and we all get inspired to start incorporating storytelling into our marketing. We're all real happy about it and we do it and we go crazy. Right? We tell stories. Everyone's happy. We have shiny pictures and beautiful stories. And then somewhere along the way, somebody starts asking questions. Well, which story should we tell? How good is what we're doing now versus what we were doing yesterday? CEOs start asking, well, why do you need 10 million more? Aren't it enough? Why shouldn't I give it to research? Why shouldn't I give it to finance? Then we start having these really tough internal questions. And we look back and we wonder, how in the world did we get here? We started with beautiful stories and pretty pictures, and now I'm having a conversation with somebody in the executive suite wondering why and wondering how I'm ever going to get my budget approved. So I know these are probably a little hard to read, but these are actual quotes from different clients at various points, some of which were paraphrased and expletives removed. Um, but in short, People want you to be able to justify your budgets. So we have to quantify it. So we do that with a bunch of reporting. It's usually how we all do it, right? And we have all these fun metrics like uh, reach and engagement rate, and who even knows what they mean. Then we have everyone's favorite AVE. Really? That's a, still a thing after 10 more years, after the Barcelona principles. And we look at follower counts, and we look at the number of tweets we've posted and the number of mentions we've gotten, and we think that's good. And for marketing people, it probably is. But like I mentioned, I'm kind of the outsider here, and I'm used to it. So as somebody that looks at this from the outside, I go, well, what is any of this worth? More importantly, who cares, right? What's a follower worth to my company? How much should I be willing to pay for an impression, and why? If somebody retweets my post, does that make them more likely to purchase? And how much more likely? 
Do that, does them watching my entire brand video accelerate the sales cycle? If not, then why do I care? Maybe. Hey guys. Oh, there we go. So let's take a step back and kind of frame this problem a little bit better. We understand that stories are good, that stories have worked for millennia, but let's ask three other questions. Number one, what role should stories play in our overall marketing strategy, and why should they play that role? Number two, what does success look like? If we tell a great story, how will we know? And how will we communicate it to other people within our organization? Not our fellow marketers, but everybody else that we're competing with for finite resources. And finally, with all that in mind, what story should we tell? Right? We all have different opinions about what customers want to hear. How do we prove what's right? So, this is always the question that I like to ask, and I ask my students this question, I ask my clients this question, I ask companies that I invest with or work with this question, how do you know? What can you prove? And if you can't prove that you're making a quantifiable contribution, then it's a bit of a problem. And usually these conversations go something like this, which is a really long way of saying, we have no idea and we have a disconnect between what everybody else in our organization talks about and what we talk about as marketers. And that's kind of a problem. So, let's put this one other way and summarize it in one nice little slide. We have a metric disconnect. What we measure and what businesses measure are not aligned. We don't have a clear strategy for how we bridge that gap. We don't coordinate well. For communicators, we're awfully bad at communicating how good we are. And as a result, bad things happen. In the US, we have a bunch of publications that are kind enough to track how fast people get fired. Anybody want to guess the shortest tenure in the executive suite? Almost, almost CMO. Close. CCO, shortest tenure in the C-suite. And it's not close. CCOs last about 22 months. CMOs are about 28. The next closest is like the director of HR and they last like four or five, six years. Whoops. For communicating, we're awfully bad at telling people how good we are. So let's reset this little situation and let's, let's start to figure out how to do that. So stories have these really fun qualities that I kind of touched on before and each one of them is innately useful for marketing and advances some really core objectives for every company, B2B, B2C, right? They're tactile, we can feel them, we can communicate with them, right? They're motivational, they make us want to do things. We tell our kids fables because we want them to act a certain way. You know, we communicate with one another in stories because we want to inspire a certain response. Our brains are hardwired to understand them. Awfully helpful. They're eminently shareable. We were sharing stories before we could even write. We could draw pictures on walls and we could share stories. And they're evergreen. They last forever. We've been telling the same stories for thousands of years. We change the characters' names and we change the plots and we add some iPhones. But at the end of the day, it's the same story. So... As a business, there's some things we care about, right? We care about awareness, we care about trust, we care about thought leadership and perception, we care about sales a lot, we care about our credibility in the marketplace, we care about our revenue and our profit, of course we do, and sometimes we care about our customers, unless you're United Airlines. Ooh, sorry, United joke. All right, and those things and a bunch of others drive four things, and it's the same four things for every company. You want preference in the marketplace, you want deal size, you want deal velocity, and you want lifetime value. That's it. At the end of the day, it's the same four things, B2B, B2C, B2 
to G, B to anybody, you want these four things. And stories can help you get there. So let's connect the two. And why should we do that? Because those four things drive the two things that every CEO I've ever met cares about. And if you know a CEO that doesn't care about these two things, please let me know because he's about to get fired. They care about their customers and they care about profit. That's it. So, let's talk about how we should be doing this. Let's start with the end goal in mind, people and profit. Those are the things we care about, so those are our business goals. Let's align our metrics to those at every stage of the journey, and then we have a nice profitable reality where we can show how great we are. So, this is kind of what got me into this entire thing is thinking about this, there has to be a better way to talk about communications. And I've gotten the opportunity to work with a number of great people who agree with me. Because we, communications delivers a ton of value. You guys are great, and when you don't communicate how great you are, the only people you're cheating are yourselves. So what's that look like? Clicker problem. Maybe. Oh, there we go. So let's, let's look at that. And then we'll look at some case studies. So this is kind of my little vision for measurement, right? We start, and most organizations, and it's awful to say, are somewhere between one and two, right? We look at vanity metrics, because they make us feel good. We see the number of likes just going up on the page, and we're like, I'm awesome. I'm great, people like me. And then every once in a while, we look at the number of placements we get, and that's cool too, because everybody wants to write about me. And then every once in a while, we'll get, kind of get into the, form, the performance metrics, we'll look at, you know, click the rates on our ads, we'll look at our cost per lead, we'll look at some cool little performance metrics, and we'll feel good about ourselves too. But that's not where we need to go. We need to go up another level, to meaningful metrics, to being insight driven, to connecting what is happening, which is what number one and number two describe. They're retroactive, they describe what has happened. Our advertising campaign got 40 placements. You know, our PR campaign generated 45 million impressions. Who cares? Let's connect that to something that we actually care about. Uh, for every new Twitter follower, a Twitter follower is 75% more likely to make a purchase. All right, that's kind of cool. And the average Twitter per person that follows us on Twitter and makes a purchase has an average order value 30% higher than our typical customer, even cooler. Now we can start attributing outcomes to what we're doing. And then finally, we get to the cool stuff, the predictive end-to-end -end outcomes, showing how well we are performing for customers at every stage of their journey, from our first introduction all the way through the time they're a loyal customer and retaining them. So we start with the end goal and obsess about intent. And I think I'm pretty sure I stole this from Avinash Kashik from Google. He's awesome, I like him a lot. I'm pretty sure I stole this from him. If I did, thank you. If I didn't, he gets credit anyway. And I say this because there's a great Einstein quote that I've always loved. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will, believe, it will live its entire life believing that it is stupid. Well, customers at different stages demand different metrics. One of the first things that we understand, somebody that's just met you can't really evaluate fairly if our metric is a marriage proposal, right? If I just meet somebody and they're like, hey, can you marry me? No, it's a little weird. It's actually a lot weird. Right, so you wanna kind of judge the efficacy of our first introduction by like, did I get a date, not did I get a marriage proposal? But conversely, if we're already married, then my goal shouldn't be to like avoid divorce, my goal should probably be like a happy marriage. Different, different stages, different intents, different metrics. So Avinash has this great framework, and it's probably the best one that I found because it's simple, it's intuitive, and it's customer first. See, think, do, care, four stages. Or if you're a business person and you've got to 
listen to all of these random talks in business school, there's awareness, consideration, purchase, loyalty, or retention, which is just an awful word. Like keeping somebody in prison by doing business with you, it's awful. My point being, four different stages, metrics for each stage. And here you go, you can do that. Here's one that we've worked with for our customer now. Each stage, we've created a unique metric to determine how successful they are. It allows us to quickly diagnose what's going right, what's going wrong, and what we can do about it. And these are different than things you might see. We talk about things like incremental increase in brand recall. How memorable is the story we're telling today versus the story we told before? We look at micro-conversions and site engagement. And then at the end, we're looking at how shareable is our content? What's the viral coefficient on this? What's our lifetime value per customer? Because those are things that I can then connect to an end outcome, and when I have to go meet with a CEO or a CFO, I can say something like, if you give me X, I can give you Y. Or our customers are 75% more profitable over their lifetime than the customers that you acquired. Aren't we great? Uh-oh. There we go. All right, so here are some different better metrics, right? Just a few more to highlight. Brand perception. We can measure this. Thank you, sentiment analysis. We can determine how favorable people are towards our brand. We can determine how permanent our ads, our ads or our campaigns or our stories are. How long after that somebody's exposed to them do they remember it? And more importantly, what does that do for their pr probability of making a purchase? That's fun. And finally, economic value. My favorite thing in the whole wide world, mostly because I'm a nerd, but also because it's an awfully useful metric. It tells me not just bottom line revenue, but anticipated revenue. And here are some other cool metrics. We've used them for clients all across the place, and I'm sure I will give you guys all this deck so you can look at them later, but they're, they're interesting. And they're connected to an outcome that the client or the stakeholder cares about. So just having better metrics isn't enough. So there's three other things that I want to encourage you to do. Number one, quantify the value that you're adding. It's not just enough to say sales, it's incremental sales. It's not just enough to say brand recall, it's incremental. The increment is what's interesting. It's always what's interesting. How people feel matters. Unfortunately, we have a great way to measure that. We don't just need to, you know, guess. We have sentiment analysis. We have machine learning. We have AI. We have some really cool things that can tell you. And we have the ability to test things on a massive scale. So on the qualitative side, stories can impact more than just a purchase decision. They can impact how a person feels about your brand. They can impact whether or not they're going to tell their friend and all of these things can be measured. There's economic value, which unfortunately I'm running short on time, and I have a lot of slides. So more or less, less or more, there are plenty of ways you can calculate how impactful these things are. From comparing it to something similar, to making friends with your finance department. Show of hands, how many of you guys have ever talked to somebody in the finance department? How many of you have talked to somebody in the finance department and you weren't asking for more money? Okay, yeah, make friends with your finance department because they are your best friends. And then you can do with and without you experiments and see if I run an ad in this market and not in this market, what's the difference? And always use the one thing that everybody gets. No matter what it is, ask how much is it worth. Everybody understands money. We all get how it works. Nobody gets engagement because no one actually understands what that means. Okay, so we can measure just about everything. We can measure sentiment, we have social listening, we've got network analysis and we can see who you're connected to and as Shree mentioned yesterday, your second order network is often better than your first. So don't be afraid of the complexity involved. So, and if we're going to test things, there's a nice way to do it just what we've been saying before. Calculate the increment, determine the revenue. 
put a dollar value on it, and if you don't know or you can't, just write a dollar or a rupee. And when somebody asks you why you put that number down, say because no one else would give me a good number and watch how fast you get a better number. It's really impressive. So, let's talk about some examples, because these are fun. So this is the typical dashboard we all get. We've got a Google Analytics dashboard and a Facebook dashboard, and we see sessions and impressions and users, and it's garbage. It's bad. It's trash, like let's be real, it's bad. But then if we get a little better, we can start looking at things like average order value, conversion rate, per session value. A little bit better, right? We're a little bit more useful, and we can break it down to which story, which campaign, which market. That's more interesting. Well, let's get even better. We can also drill down to average crop conversion probability. That's cool. Somebody I get via social, 15 times more likely to convert than somebody that I got through direct. Well, that's helpful. Things that I can say, and I can also connect that to a conversion value, and I can tell my boss, well, this customer is worth this much, and I should pay this much, and I'm great because I do this. And then Facebook has done something right. Zuck was good, and he gave us these wonderful impact surveys that you can run. And I love them, because they give you awesome reports like this. Somebody watches your video for 10 seconds, and they are 76% more likely to convert than somebody who didn't watch your video. And if I combine TV with social, the conversion impact over somebody that doesn't see my ad, plus 28.9%. Fantastic. I know the impact, and I can quickly translate that number to a dollars and cents figure and give it to somebody. That's powerful. And then you have these other fun ones where we're doing the same thing. We're just doing it on a bigger scale. And here's a fun one. We all know Tesla, right? America's most interesting company. On the top, you see their stock price. On the bottom, you see the sentiment on social media about Tesla. Notice a nice little correlation? It's like 0.75 on the correlation matrix. How much people are talking about them and how happy they are dictates their stock price. And it's not just Tesla. This is Bitcoin. Same correlation. It's insane. The way people talk about you, the way people perceive you, drives how valued you are. And there's this great company. I mentioned that I got to work with some awesome people. One of them is Proof. They're actually building a platform that connects any marketing metric you have to any outcome metric you have and tells you how strongly correlated they are. It's like the next generation of stuff. And I have absolutely no stake in them. I just really like them. So full disclosure. So let's talk about some examples. The first is Airbnb. We've all heard of Airbnb, yes? Great. So this is a company that started in San Francisco and had no money and had a really innovative business model where we did something crazy. Remember Shree's story yesterday about Barack Obama? Have you guys forgotten that one yet? We go to West 109th Street and we sit outside in a suitcase. Great, Airbnb was like, maybe we should probably fix that situation and like give them a place to stay. So here's the problem. Airbnb is trying to disrupt hotels by letting people stay with other people that they don't know. It's a weird business model in the US. Like, that's not something we do. But here we are, right? So you have two overarching goals. Number one, create buzz about the company. And number two, make it easy for hosts and guests to get started, right? That's our goal. We want to connect buyers and sellers in an interesting marketplace that we're creating out of scratch with a weird concept. So here we go. Airbnb, for the first like year and a half, could barely get any bookings. They were selling cereal to try to make payroll. All right, they were making up cereal to make payroll and revenue. It's crazy. And then they got this crazy idea when they were broke, like, hey, let's uh, start telling visual stories. Let's let hosts tell a story about their place, about what will be happening, about what's going on, about who they are. And let's see if that works, because nothing else we're doing is working. So we started telling these visual stories. And a startup with absolutely no money starts investing in professional photographers who are not cheap. Somehow I figured that one out, and I don't understand why, but because I think I'm a pretty good photographer and I do it for free. But apparently I missed something. And 
something started to happen. People started to talk about Airbnb. And then people started to search for Airbnb. And then, crazy enough, when all those things happening, people started to rent from Airbnb. Look at that. And now they make a ton of money. Like, a lot. Like, if you had invested in Airbnb, you'd be very, very wealthy right now. <laughs> because, you know, 120, 000, 120 million bookings a year, 1.4 billion in revenue, yeah, that's not terrible. You could be pretty happy with that. And now they're a global phenomenon, millions and millions of Airbnbs, people use them all the time, it's an accepted alternative to hotels. And it all started because they started telling stories. Of course, no one's ever bothered to connect these things before, because it was a very difficult thing to find a connection between any of these, but it's what I do for you guys. But let's do one that's a little bit more uh, prox um, interesting, right? So Airbnb is keeping it going. They're living like a local. They're creating Airbnb experiences to make that story even more real. And they're telling stories the entire way. The other thing that I like that they do is they always measure impact. Every part of their business model is built on testing. And every part of their tests are built on revenue. It's awesome. All of the sophisticated marketing technology in the world and they focus on outcomes. So I have a minute and 40 seconds left even though I got cheated two minutes. So let's talk about Nike. Who's heard of Colin Kaepernick? Awesome. He is an American football player. I was reminded to say American football because soccer situations. Anyway, so Nike did this crazy thing. We have this big social conversation in the US about race and gender and you know, we were fortunate enough to have a speaker yesterday that touched on this as well. And it's a big deal and it's controversial. So Nike, we all know Nike, just do it, perfect. Decided to run a crazy campaign in the US and feature Colin Kaepernick, a quarterback that's not even playing in the NFL. And their whole goal was to increase revenue from a specific audience segment, namely millennials, African Americans, Latinos, and some Gen Xers, or basically anybody under the age of 50. That was it, that was the goal. And this is a different kind of story, it's one that I really like, because it's a story within a story. We have a broader conversation in the US, and Nike engineered this one to appeal to that specific group that cares about that story a lot. They were ready for a backlash because they knew it was coming. And they had a plan in place to calculate impact. Before they told the story, they knew how they were going to determine if it was successful or not. Eight seconds. Shoot. So they ran some pretests, like we all should. And they almost didn't run the campaign. The ads scored. Whoopsies. I'm out of time. All right, cool, good, almost done, right? So below average scores overall, clarity and brand scores were through the floor, and the talk scores were through the roof, right? People were gonna talk about this ad, and people weren't exactly sure what to make of it. So they ran some more before and after tests. Before, everyone kind of neutral towards Nike. After, we got some strong opinions, like real strong. And they were especially strong among older white people, who really hated it, and everybody younger who really loved it. So what does Nike do? They ran it. They had good reason to believe it would increase purchase intent and purchase favorability, and they knew a reaction was coming, and they were ready for it on social. Sp comments were nasty, but then something happened, right? And in addition to all the mentions they got, and remember, so mentions weren't that interesting, what about purchase intent? Massive increase. 75% of the tweets that had purchase intent were favorable to Nike. And what does that translate to? Well, 31% increase in online sales. That's 78.9 million a week in incremental revenue at a 43% margin for Nike. And what was their additional incremental marketing investment? About 85,000 bucks a week. You show me a CEO that won't give you 85,000 to make 78 million, and I will again find you, show you something that's out of a job. 
And finally, Nike, since this ad has aired, gained 9.5 billion, with a B, in market cap. And they've tracked all of it, and they've been very happy to tout it. But this all started because they were willing to test, and they had a plan to measure. And now their team can go back and say how great they are. And I guarantee you the next time Nike's agencies and communications people ask for money, they will get it. So, I realize it's a lot, and I'm very sorry for messing up the time schedule, but there's three things I'd like you to remember. Number one, being better at measurement isn't optional anymore. And it's not easy to do, so start. Start somewhere. Start thinking about something that you can connect to an outcome. Two, don't make it an afterthought. When you start a campaign, ask, how am I going to measure this? How will I know if it's successful? And who will care about what I'm telling them? And then three is end-to-end -end outcomes. Not just the beginning, not just the end, the whole customer journey. You guys are phenomenal at what you do, and you generate way more business value than you get credit for. So, make it your personal challenge to show the world, and show, more importantly, your boss, who controls your raises and your promotions, how good you are. So, thank you guys very much for indulging me and for your attention.